Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Tobin, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the political economy of protracted displacement. Uh, this program today is brought to you from a Research Council of Norway funded project uh, entitled States of Protractedness, Utilizing Norwegian Expertise for Solutions to Protracted Dis Displacement Situations. And in the project, uh, it aims to give more Norwegian scholars, policymakers, and the public access to the knowledge produced in Horizon 2020 projects, and by drawing on parallel research being conducted in Norway. We also aim to collaborate to reinforce the effects of each of these projects. Uh, we are also uh, going to vet and share and promote the proven solutions for protracted displacement, a lofty aim. But today we're going to examine more closely what we could mean or do mean by the phrase, the political economy of protracted displacement. The political economy aspect of protracted displacement looks at how both political and economic interests are at play in various places and countries and um, in different times that work towards prolonging and deepening displacement situations rather than resolving them. So as a result, today we're kind of flipping the lens, if you will, or flipping the, the framework. So instead of looking at and promoting proven solutions, uh, instead we're looking at some of the ways that protracted displacement can be um, continued, the ways that the solutions may be thwarted or stalled. This is not a typical way of thinking about or necessarily looking at the topic of protracted displacement, but one that we believe is potentially quite generative. So hence today, we aim to have with this webinar a conversation aiming to create some new ideas. Uh, although protractedness clearly holds a temporal dimension, today we seek to engage in a conversation about protracted displacement that both includes and goes beyond temporalities. With this political economy framework, we aim to assess other constraints as well as hopefully some opportunities between the local events and global structures that prolong and deepen displacement situations. So I'd like to offer my thanks to Anya and to Bergen Global for the support today. Also thanks to Benjamin Etzold, who will be uh, moderating and the traffic project and to the participants and speakers. And they include, as I mentioned, uh, Benjamin Benjamin Etzold. He's a senior researcher at BIC, the Bonn International Center for Conversion. He works on patterns uh, and trajectories of migration and displacement and studies people's vulnerabilities, livelihoods, labor relations and mobilities in different regions. Uh, he is the lead of the interdisciplinary international EU funded research project traffic transnational figurations of displacement, which looks at how to make use of translocal networks and mobilities to overcome conditions of protracted displacement. Uh, he's got a number of publications, most recently, uh, including violence, mobility and labor relations in Asia, which was published in the International Quarterly for Asian Studies. Our second speaker will be Sonova Bendixson. She's an associate professor of social anthropology at the University of Bergen. She's working on the Research Council of Norway funded Supercamp project on humanitarian containment within the Middle East. She's on fieldwork with refugees and other migrants along the Balkan route. And latest and important publications include uh, Time and the Other Waiting and Hope Among Irregular Migrants, which was published in Ethnographies of Waiting, Doubt, Hope, and Uncertainty. Third, we have Morten Boas. He's a research professor at NUPI, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and he works mainly with topics related to peace and conflict in Africa, including issues such as land rights and citizenship conflicts, youth and ex-combatants, and the new landscapes that emerge with regard to insurgency and geopolitics. He's a current manager of the Horizon 2020 project, Preventing Violent Extremism in the Balkans, uh, and the MENA Strengthening Resilience in Enabling Environments, uh, PREVEX. He has also uh, previously been the PI on another Horizon 2020 project. He is widely published and cited, um, and important publications include, for example, EU Migration Management in the Sahel, Unintended Consequences on the Ground in Niger, which was published in Third World Quarterly last year. Then we have Tuadros Kebede. He is a senior researcher at the FAFO Institute for Labor and Social Research based in Oslo. Uh, he assesses the results and impacts of capacity building programs within the framework of North-South cooperation. He's worked on a variety of studies on issues related to decent work and labor rights, both in Norway and abroad, most especially in Jordan and Ethiopia. 
Um, he's also conducted research on collective organization, legal frameworks, and social conditions of working life, analyzing the conditions for change as well as their results. Most recently, he has participated in a number of very important studies assessing the impacts of COVID on vulnerable populations, refugees, and uh, labor in Iraq and in Jordan. And finally, I'm Sarah Tobin. I'm a research professor at CMI, uh, and I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. So with that, I will turn it over to Benjamin to uh, kick off with some insights from the traffic project. Yeah, um, hi everybody, um, and uh, thanks a lot um, to to you, Sarah, for this very kind introduction, and um, yeah, to the whole Bergen Global team. Um, I actually never really know who who was always behind um, this um, for the very kind kind invitation to join you in this discussion. I'm uh, looking forward to um, talking with you. Um, let me quickly share um, my screen with you. I don't have many slides; just wanted to go through uh, through some um, key aspects sort of them, you know, how we are conceptualizing um, protracted displacement um, in our project. Um, let me just see, can I actually share a slide? Um, Bildschirm freigeben, okay, hang on a second. Okay, you should be able to see your screen now. Um, as Sarah said, sort of I'm the scientific coordinator um, of the project um, Transnational Figurations um, of Displacement, funded uh, by the European Union under this um, framework of the Horizon 2020 um, Research Innovation Program. We're a project with 12 partners um, from 11 different countries, among which, that's why I'm also here, um, the Christian Michelson Institute, with, with uh, Sarah being the PI for CMI. And we are conducting research on the social constellations in which protracted, protectedly displaced people find themselves in different regions, different contexts, um, particularly um, in the Congo, in Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Jordan, but also in Pakistan, Greece, Italy, and Germany. Um, and we are now in a very interesting phase of a project, so where the empirical research um, has come to an end, and we're trying to bring together the findings. Um, I won't go into much detail with presenting detailed um, detailed findings of it. I just wanted to co convey like what I say like six key messages um, on protracted displacement um, to you. Um, I mean, you are aware sort of that the term uh, protracted refugee situation or so is not, it's not very old, it's just about around 20 years ago that the UNHCR coined this term in order to draw attention to the situation of refugees who are in an extended exile um, and to highlight the need to promote more durable solutions. Yet, um, sort of the search for solutions for persons in longer term displacement um, has actually been at the heart of the international refugee protection regime ever since its initiation in the early 1920s. Um, and as our colleague Albert Kraler from um, Danube University Krems um, sort of found and has sketched out um, in the working paper, Learning from the Past. Um, he looked at refugee protection since the First World War and how the debate about solutions and later than durable solution evolved ever since. Um, he showed um, in his research that um, historically return and resettlement um, have often been favored as durable solutions, um, but also that in general sort of mobility options have always been a component of successful solution strategies in major crises of displacement in the past. Um, so the emergence of this term protracted um, displacement uh, highlights more than anything else. Actually, it's the failure of the international protection regime to deliver a key promise, namely that dispersed per displaced persons are able to regain a degree of normality and to rebuild their lives. Um, in recent years, uh, the debates about protected displacement was, I think, reinvigorated again by the policy debates and particularly by the initiation and then later the conclusion of the UN Global Compact on Refugees in 2018. Um, I mean, are you all aware about sort of the statistical developments in last, uh, last week uh, or last Sunday, the uh, latest um, Global Trends report was published by UNHCR. And you see, when you look into it, that um, the most recent number of those people who are in a protracted refugee um, situation is 15.7 million people, 
who have been living in exile for more than five years in a given asylum country. This is the statistical definition used by the UNHCR. An extended definition um, stresses that displaced people often become stuck in a long lasting intractable state of limbo. So it refers rather to the social situation um, of being stuck in a sense, uh, in a situation where legal status is often not guaranteed, where basic rights are not fulfilled, where refugees um, depend on external assistance to sustain their livelihoods, and where there are really not no um, good prospects of return, of resettlement, or lo local integration. In other words, um, the term protracted displacement refers to highly precarious situations um, in yeah, which people are stuck somewhat um, in a, for a long period of time after becoming displaced. I think it's also important to stress that we also need to move this term beyond the discussion of refugees and include migrants, IDPs, or stateless people um, in the debate. Um, as you're very well aware, sort of over the past 20 years, sort of we have seen large academic debates about migrants agency and in the context of refugees also about coping strategies, livelihoods, everyday practices, homemaking and other aspects sort of that relate uh, to the everyday lives um, of displaced people. Um, also in policy circles, sort of refugees agency um, has been acknowledged and this gave rise to more recent debates also in policy, but also in academia about self-reliance, um, a term that is very prominent also again in the global compact on refugees, but also in policy debates in Europe, for instance, when it comes to the central um, communication by the European Commission um, on this topic, uh, lives and dignity from 2016. So while we as a project fully subscribe to this notion of agency, and in our research, we also have found clear evidence um, of displaced people's multiple coping strategies, their creativity, their adaptability, and also sometimes uh, we would be seeing surprising alliances that have been formed between displaced people and members of receiving communities. Uh, we also see clear limits to this agency and to refugee self-reliance. And from a conceptual perspective, um, we have identified three particularly structural forces that potentially and often constantly keep displaced people in a precarious situation of protractedness, namely displacing forces, marginalizing forces, and immobilizing forces. Uh, this conception mirrors somewhat, but it's not entirely equivalent with this sort of triad of durable solutions, repatriation, integration, and resettlement. Um, for us, these dis forces are um, distinguished um, from another, from another. Displacing forces prevent displaced persons from returning and are at play in the country or region of origin and can be at play as well in first, second, and further host countries or regions. Marginalizing forces effectively block local integration and are at play in the country or region of current stay, whereas immobilizing forces, they hinder onward mobility and are at play in the country or region of origin um, as well in the transit and host countries. Um, we see and we saw, clearly saw in our research, that it's not easy for displaced people to overcome these structural forces to actually enact the agency sometimes also in resistance to states, uh, policies, and to other actors that somehow and continuously work on dragging them down. It's thus important to reframe in our, um, as we, we would say, protracted displacement as particularly social constellation in which both structure and agency are at play. In our project, we thus define, redefine protracted displacement as a social constellation. We call it a figuration in which the capabilities of people for rebuilding their lives after displacement and the opportunities available to do so are severely limited for prolonged level periods of time. Um, yeah, a few more other points. I mean, oftentimes protracted displacement is understood as a situation of immobility. Displaced people are being stuck at a place without options to work, to move on or to return. And the very vast research on, on refugees in camps, for instance, reflects this. But however, we need to take into account, and we actually saw it in our research, the multiple mobilities of displaced people. Often these mobilities are rather small scale. In many contexts, refugees are living in camps, but actually move out of camps temporarily on a day-to-day -day basis, for instance, to find work. Um, Jordan uh, is, a, is a case in point, and I'm sure Sarah can and say much more about that. Uh, also in Ethiopia, sort of Eritrean refugees were allowed to move out of the camps in the wake of the 
government's out of camp policy, um, but not all benefit from it. Um, first, refugees also needed a sponsor to move out of, out of camps. Um, and even those who mo could move out of the camps, for instance, in the from the Tigray region, many moved then to the capital Addis, capital Addis Abeba. This didn't mean that one could actually secure one's livelihood and become self-reliant. So sort of being able to move a camp didn't mean that the time of protractedness um, has ended. So we want to raise awareness to say that, okay, protracted displacement is not equal with immobility. Sarah also already mentioned the important aspect of time, time frame, and the statistical definition is always this um, five plus years or so that people are stuck um, in an exile situation. We also need to acknowledge that the multiple transformations that actually take place during that time and after the time, sort of the yeah, figurational changes um, that are taking place after displacement has um, occurred, whether this is within the constellation of the, of the family, whether the policy situation changes, um, very dynamic environments that are there. And also we see that you need to move beyond this notion of stuckedness and waiting, which often frames the people as like passive um, until a durable solution is presented to them, is found for them. But to actually see how displaced people try to make their own futures, but as I said, experience drawbacks in terms of their agency and being able to control their present and their future. I think it's important to highlight um, that uh, we're not only talking about displacement and refugee situations in the global south, uh, which is classically um, the, the, the term used in, but we can, of course, have to um, apply it to other groups, other migrants, stateless people, as I said before, but also apply it to contexts in the, in the global north. Um, colleagues of ours in Greece uh, from Aristotle University are conducting research um, in Athens and on the Aegean Islands and Lesbos, for instance. And I think you're all well, well, very well aware of um, the situation in camps in Moria and how the situation um, of those people who have been stuck on the island became more and more uh, protracted, and particularly due to mobil multiple mobility restrictions that the government has enforced, and because of the lack of cooperation in the European Union, which doesn't allow for relocation of those um, refugees and migrants who are on the islands. Um, we also see it in Italy, where our colleagues Fieri are doing research, sort of that um, migrants there are in a mobility dilemma. Um, some are stuck in a place um, without work, but being stuck in a place and not being mobile enables them yeah, to bit by bit try to regularize their status. And others are highly mobile. They move um, with the seasonal calendar, trying to access work different parts of Italy and beyond Italy. Um, but this mobility actually jeopardizes the opportunity to regularize the status, to be part of the regular asylum procedure uh, and this. So I think it's for us worthwhile to think about protracted um, displacement um, at multiple places in the world, and particularly also in Europe, and how, and how this relates to policies um, that are put in place by states, but also by the European um, Union. Last point um, that is particularly important to traffic, and well, at, at least for me as a geographer, is how the notion of protracted displacement relates to space. Um, as I said, it's not equal with immobility, with being stuck in a place. Um, Nonetheless, protected displacement is certainly in place in the sense that it unfolds at certain sites, be it in a camp or in a city of refugee, a refuge. Um, as protracted displacement is first and foremost a political concept, it is also deeply rooted in territorial thinking. It is states that provide solutions for refugees. And when you listen to policymakers and humanitarian actors speaking about these durable solutions, you become very aware how deeply this concept is rooted in yeah, territorial thinking. Um, yeah, the displaced people, they are either here, and then we have to work towards enabling their local integration, or they are there or supposed to be there, moving back to the country of origin, um, optimally with voluntary return, but also for enforced repatriation or enhance options to move to third countries via resettlement or other mobility schemes, labor, family reunification, student mobility, et cetera. Um, what is not in the mind frame of policymakers is that refugees and migrants often live a transnational life. 
when you have been highly mobile for this before displacement or can build on wide networks, most often direct personal relations to um, have personal relations to members of the family living abroad, but also their very vast diaspora relations. For instance, when you look at um, Eritrean networks um, or the Kurdish, um, Syrish Kurdish networks that um, facilitate mobility on the one hand, but are also there to help integration of different diverse places in Europe. This is a core argument that policymakers and humanitarian actors have to acknowledge existing transnational relations um, and that displaced people aim to find solutions by building on their own network relations. Mobility is then also not always linear, but there are multiple and often you know, circular mobilities, back and forth movements. And our research with internal displaced people in Bukavu in Congo and with Afghan refugees in Pakistan demonstrate these multiple mobilities and the embeddedness in translocal spaces quite impressively. So we would argue then that the debate about ending protracted displacement also needs to move beyond these three durable solutions that constantly try to fix people in space. We need to acknowledge people's embeddedness in networks beyond a place or a country and the multiple and complementary pathways to use to reconnect at and across various places and how they are then de facto leading trans local lives. Um, yeah, let me end um, with, with, with this um, and let me end sharing my screen. Okay, um, I hope some key aspects um, sort of came across and what, what we have worked uh, in our project. I also have to admit, and that relates then to the title um, of today's webinar, we haven't been very strong uh, yet um, in really investigating political economic dimensions of protracted mm -hmm. displacement. Um, I mean, while we saw, you know, how policies, how political regimes um, have evolved in these countries of, um, yeah, of first reception or, or refuge where we have worked, um, and we also try to investigate, you know, the contributions that displaced people have in the respective local economies or so, um, this broader political economic framing is, I think, nonetheless very, very interesting. Um, and as a point of discussion, I would now first uh, would like to like to hear um, from you sort of what this in your research, um, what this political economy perspective actually means um, for you, and what you think. You know, as Sarah mentioned in her inter introduction, how uh, protracted displacement relates to both like political structures, but also economic interests of other diverse actors at the places where you have conducted research. And so to speak, you know, what is the global, national, local uh, power play, you know, that we can see and how this, how this relates to protracted displacement. Mm -hmm. So first, um, as understood, sort of um, Sinove um, would, be, would be you to start start off um, the discussion about this political di economic dimensions on protracted displacement. Uh, so th thank you, uh, Benjamin, for this really great introduction to the theme. Um, I like to start off with showing uh, some uh, aspects of the research that I've been part of, because as you were mentioning, uh, this uh, displacement also takes place in the global north, and that's where my research uh, is really relevant. And while the situation I will talk about doesn't really uh, call up to the definition of UNHCR definition, we can see that many of the social situation and the experience of a protected um, displacement is really at hand and a lot of the mechanism that you talked about and also I think that we can continue talking about in the discussion is really it's it's very similar mechanism and structures which is going on so uh, basically uh, the research that I'll talk very shortly about before we move over to to your question is uh, the uh, uh, research council of Norway project which is called supercamp genealogies of humanitarian containment in the Middle East and uh, the main idea is that we are talking about a super camp in the sense that the Middle East, re uh, Middle East region forms a zone of containment. People are trying to be stuck there. They are, they are really hold back. Uh, and uh, this we call a kind of a super camp under a humanitarian government. 
And we have various researchers with us and various case studies. We have Italy, Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and the Balkan route. And um, I'll shortly in a second talk about then the Balkan route. And these are the researchers. Uh, it is um, uh, led by Ar Knutsen at Christian Mikkelsen's Institute. And we also have Antonio Lilaro and uh, Charles Berg as researchers among others. Since time is short, I'll just very shortly talk to you about the Balkan route where I have done field work uh, on these issues. And why the Balkan route? Well, in, uh, it was very popular in 2015 and it was so-called so declared closed by uh, Frontex and the EU authorities in 2016. Although of course it was not closed, it was just made harder to, to continue through. And actually that idea of closure is what created a form, form of containment or prolonged uh, displacement for the people who are trying to go through. Nobody wants to apply asylum in Serbia and Bosnia. They want to traverse uh, the, the region. So it's a transit region really in order to to come into the EU or Schengen countries. And so a lot of people are still using the road uh, and uh, they're mainly from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, North Africa. And they're then arriving through, through Turkey, going through Greece, crossing North, uh, North Macedonia in two days and then coming over to Serbia and then either going uh, to uh, Bosnia or for going from Serbia to Hungary, Serbia to um, uh, to Bul uh, Bulgaria actually a little bit back in order to cross because it's getting more and more hard to cross. And that has been my focus that we can really talk about here interruption effects. So some people talk about it as containment and Benjamin was also talking about this continuation between mobility and immobility and how that uh, takes a particular form in this, uh, in this um, region. So these interruption effects, I argue, are then part of the EU externalization policies uh, and the bordering practices in the region. But it's also a consequence of the Balkan uh, nation states politics, because both Serbia and uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina are wanting to be part of the EU. And so they're accepting a lot of the uh, expectations from EU in that negotiation of EU inclusion. So uh, EU has a really huge impact on how that uh, migration policies and refugee policies are, are constituted currently in the region. So uh, Serbia and Bosnia, they're both like, yes, we wanna apply to the EU externalization policies. We are trying to stop them to continue into the EU Schengen. We, they're willing to be kind of like a block, like uh, not ma making that pass by. At the same time, they really don't want the asylum. Uh, uh, refugees, uh, uh, asylum seekers and refugees to stay there. They, so it's a really a doubleness, right? Uh, which has is, which is come through. And that's why you are having the effect is that migrants are moved forward, go back. They have to find different routes. They are in camps. They are, the camps are not very livable and they are set up as not very liv livable for, for a long time perspective. And so uh, the border practices then are obstructing these migrants journey. They are disturbing it. And simultaneously, there is an agency. Benjamin, you also talked about this agency, yes, of, of moving on. You have structures which, is trying, which are trying to contain you, but they are trying continuously. And this is what gives the region, I argue, a, a labyrinthian characteristic, actually, because you're going this direction. No, it doesn't work. You are being pushed back by a Croatian a border guards, for example, and then you're trying a different route. Uh, so... Rather than containment being stuck, they are really having a continuous mobility. Uh, and this is, yeah, as I said, this is part of border management with externalization. And uh, it is also this uh, Euro uh, Europeanization of migration control. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, with this region, there's also this idea of Balkan as the other, right? So it's also this otherness which Balkan and, uh, has to deal with in the way that they're negotiating with EU and the way that EU is relating to this region. And we really can see here this, what Nicolas de Genova has called the border spectacle, uh, which is again, not necessarily stopping them, but it's making, it's interrupting them. And so uh, just a uh, final uh, idea of what we're seeing then is that there is a tempor the temporality of migration in this region is that you are going from being a transit to having this containment or labyrinthian 
uh, feeling. Uh, they do not apply for asylum. It's because uh, it's really hard. The asylum system is not very well developed in the region. Um, they are not encouraged to, to apply for asylum either when they arrive in Serbia or Bosnia. Uh, they're not informed about the process. And many of the refugees that I talked to said, well, what should I do here? Even the Serbs or the Bosnians don't have a job. How should I get a job? So there is no prospect of a future in the region. And so they are continuously going on the game, which in this case is what they call trying to cross the next border. So many people tried 30 times going on the game, uh, continuously trying. And of course, it, they use a lot of money. There's a lot of smuggler networks being involved here uh, and, and a lot of helpers in, in that uh, movement. Uh, just very uh, shortly then, I just wanted to, uh, to talk, mention quickly this very absurdity of this going and, and stopping. Uh, so when you arrive to, so after uh, refugees and migrants arrive to Serbia, they go over to Bosnia, which, which is quite easy actually, that, that border crossing is easy. And in Tuzla, which is the first place they arrive, they, get, they can register and they get papers. And with those papers, they can legally transverse the, the region they will not be stopped. So they have, I think it's a 14 days uh, paper that allows them to go through. So they buy a bus ticket to go up north in Bosnia, uh, close to Bihać, because Bihać, then you have the mountains and then you have a Croatia on the back. But on their way, everyone has to take this bus, Eurolines, and in Kluc, it's, it's like along the road, and funnily enough, Kluc, Kluc uh, a Bosnian told me, actually means key. Uh, so it has a symbolic thing. There, every day, there's a policeman stopping the bus, entering the bus to see everyone's documents. And if they have these 14 days uh, documentation, they're taken out of the bus and not allowed to continue. And that's a Unasana canton. It's a local uh, policy, which has nothing to do with a, with a whole a national policy. So they're stuck there, stuck there for, for a couple of days. Or they continue on foot or they continue on all kind of different ways to, to, to go further to the border. So um, yeah, that's, that was all for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, great, Simo. I was um, very much astonished um, sort of now to, to, to hear your examples of the, um, of the Balkan, of the, along the Balkan route, and particularly um, coming back again to this question of the, of the, the political economy, um, at, at play here, uh, really important to, to understand and to keep in mind the, yeah, the Western Balkan countries' longer ambition to become part of the European Union, sort of the negotiations taking place in preparation of that with the European Union, um, which also then sort of somehow limits their, their, their own options to, 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 you know, to develop their own policies in this, but very much um, determined um, yeah, by by, uh, by the perspectives of the European, European Commission and sort of being part of the yeah, European border spectacle um, in this whole, whole process. Um, I think we are uh, straightly, uh, without any uh, asking further questions or so, I think we're straight uh, moving on um, to, Mar uh, to Morten Boas. Um, and uh, Morten, I mean, I know a lot of your work mainly like on mobilities, on migration, on migration control. Um, across across the Mediterranean towards Europe um, over the over the over the last over the last years would be also interested to hear from you you know your your take uh, on the topic and again sort of this notion you know what is the political um, economic um, dimension in it thank you uh, Benjamin and thanks to uh, our friends in Bergen for organizing this uh, I mean, <coughs> Most of my work is not necessarily neither on migration nor on uh, people going to Europe. I mean, most of my work is more on uh, various political economies of conflict in Africa and uh, also the, the Middle East. But having worked in these kind of areas and also done a couple of projects on various uh, large scale, both the refugee crises, like the one in northern Uganda, uh, like the Nakivala refugee settlement where I worked together with uh, Tevodros uh, in the past uh, and uh, along the Liberian uh, Ivorian border and now re more recently working in um, 
in uh, Mali and Niger and parts of the Sahel, I mean, important uh, transit areas. I mean, it has led me to sort of, and I guess Theodorus will also talk more about this, that <clears throat> while I acknowledge that the crises can be protracted and that people live in protect protracted crises, I have a few issues with the way that this idea about a protracted crisis of refugees has been coined in a way. And my main problem with it, with it is basically that it focuses, the way that it has been coined within the refugee studies literature is that it focuses almost exclusively on, on the refugees and the migrants. Whereas if you cast a more sort of political economy lens to this, what you will see is basically what me and Theodorus has called, uh, and others have called displacement economies. Economies that brings together refugees, migrants, and local hosts. And this plays out very differently, both in various more camp settings, but also on the various paths that the refugees and migrants take. And you cannot sort of just take it for granted that the ones that are always the most constrained with regard to the, their agencies are the refugees and the migrants. It can also work the other way around. I mean, we have several examples of extremely constrained host communities who feel that, they are, that their livelihood is under immense pressure due to the fact that they are hosting enormous amounts of refugees slash migrants. And I think we need to become better at bringing these two perspectives together. And then you really need this sort of focus on the local political economy. What kind of new power configurations are emerging both locally, but also local globally due to the fact that certain areas becomes either like large camps for refugees, becomes en uh, enormous refugee settlements, like the case of Nakival in southwestern Uganda, or become extremely important transit points as the, the city of Agadez, deep into the desert of um, Niger became. And then you will start to see a number of interesting, both similarities, but also differences. And it's quite interesting, I mean, if I can take a minute to sort of compare some of these situations. I mean, if you cast this kind of sort of local political perspective on, this, on the interactions in and around the Nakivale refugee settlement in Uganda, you will see that what this has led to over the decades, because this is a refugee settlement that basically has lasted since 1959. It's one of the oldest refugee settlements in the world. It's an immense competition for researchers between various groups of refugees, but also between various groups of refugees and local inhabitants that lives or should I say, on the shore of the refugee settlement. And as the boundaries of the refugee settlement is sort of expands, but also at times sort of retracts again, this is creating a dynamic competition for, for resources where, for example, some of the ones that really benefit from this is large scale far Ugandan farmers who live far enough enough from the refugee settlement that they are not threatened with having their land expropriated to make room for more refugees, but it's still close enough so that they can use the refugee settlement as a seasonal pool of cheap labor. Whereas on the other hand, some of these people who really feel that they are losing from this are smaller Ugandan, I mean, Ugandan peasants with much smaller plot those who live much closer to the camp, who live in constant fear of having their land basically expropriated in order to make room for more refugees. So, I mean, you have a very sort of complex, highly dynamic, immensely competitive local economy here, where you have, if you want to sort of say anything about winners and losers, you need to look at this both as it unfolds, but also over time. And you will see that, I mean, there isn't... A, cannot make a clear-cut distinction saying that one group is 
always more constrained in their agency than, than it other. It changes with the circumstances, with, with the size of the camp, what kind of refugees are in the camp, what kind of competences they have, and so on and so forth, and to, to the extent to which they will or will not compete with local hosts for scarce resources, basically. <clears throat> On the other hand, I mean, if you compare this situation to the situation that at least existed, but still exists, but although on a much smaller scale in the town of Agadez. Because here the, the local political economy becomes completely different. Why is that the case? It's the case because whereas Nakival is a refugee settlement, people are settled there. And then every year a few lucky ones are selected as UN quota refugees, whereas the rest of them basically stays there until they either go home or just continue to live there. And you have people who have grown up in this camp and who have basically never lived elsewhere. Whereas the only reasonable way to look at Agadez, the city of Agadez, is to consider it as a port. It's a port city in an ocean of sand, basically. And as any port, it depends on ships passing. It depends on customers, because this is what people make their livelihood from it. That is basically serving customers that is passing. So, I mean, the more, the more people who passes here, I mean, the better, basically. I mean, not necessarily for everybody, but for most of the people. I mean, refugees are uh, migrants. Great thing. But it's a great thing because they pass through. They don't stay there. They stay there for, I mean, the perfect refugee scene from a local Agadesian point of view is somebody who comes there, stays for four, five, six, seven days, um, eats and drinks locally because they have to eat and drink locally and they have to pay for it. And, they, and then they move on in order to make room for a new client to come and stays for a couple of days and then moving on. I mean, it's a perfect, from an Agadesian point of view, this is a perfect situation. So here you have the, the opposite. I mean, here pe local people feel that their agency has been constrained by the policy put in place by the European Union, which basically is trying to for force the Nigerian government to clamp down on this and constrain the movement of people. So it's a completely opposite situation that is created politically, and it's a completely opposite political economy at play here. And I think we need to be, we need much more in these kind of studies to bring in that local political economy perspective to see the kinds of dynamic economic games that are happening in and around these various protracted crises. And I think this is necessary both because it will enrich our empirical studies and our ability to make further conceptualizations around a phenomenon that will continue to be basically trend setting in the, more, uh, in the modern world as we move uh, forward. But we also need that kind of perspective in order to become better at giving more concrete policy recommendations to both to governments, but also to the various agencies involved in migration refugee management, because one, we need to become better at seeing both sides of this coin, and we need to bring in that element of the local competitive interaction between various groups of people and how this is played out from one context to another, but also how this changes over time and how these local economies are so immensely affected by also global initiatives, like for example, the EU's attempt to basically externalize its uh, border management. And I'm not saying that the EU shouldn't have done anything because I mean, the situation in Agadez when the port was most busy, that was in 2015, when, when maybe 250,000 people may have passed through Agadez on their way to through the desert into Libya towards the Mediterranean. I mean, that is not sustainable. It's not sustainable in the long run in any way. 
and neither is it politically sustainable. So I mean, one needed to do something. But we, if border control is to be externalized, which has its pros and cons, if you look at it realistically, because I mean, you cannot sort of having an open world of open borders. I don't think is simply possible. So borders need to be managed in one way or another. And there may be good reasons uh, for the European Union to, to externalize some of its uh, border management. But then it needs to be done with that kind of local economy perspective attached to it. So that they understand the realities on the ground. Because, I mean, as I try to highlight in the article that uh, Sara mentioned in her uh, introduction, I mean, this is also... From a, if you look at this from a really sort of or sort of political realism perspective of the European Union, what they've done is silly because it may uh, in the end up it will threaten an immensely complicated local political compromise in Niger between the local Tuareg elite in Agadez and the central government in Niamey because you just have to face it. I mean, what has happened? is not popular in Agadez because they feel that their livelihood has been constrained. And if you ask people, they will tell you that the EU promised that they, in, in exchange for this restriction on, uh, on mobility and movement across Agadez towards the border, they would, the city would receive additional economic support to redirect its livelihood towards, well, other alternative sources of livelihood I'm not really certain that anybody understands what that actually is here, but that's another matter. But none of that um, promised external assistance has surfaced. So, I mean, this was, uh, for me, just a sort of short way of trying to sort of exemplify both what, I'm, what I personally mean by a local political economy uh, perspective, how we can think about this as a as displacement economy and an economy cre economy is created by displacement and why I believe such a perspective is necessary. Thank you. And sorry if I was talking for too long. No, I think it has been great. Um, uh, Morten, I really want to thank you for bringing up, I mean, particularly these very dynamic um, social constellations um, that are at place and, and where um, displaced people, uh, local communities inter interact and also compete over resources with one another. I think that's a very important aspect, I mean, which is, of course, very um, prominent um, in the lingo also of the European Commission and in the, in the, in the Global Compact for Refugees. So this whole sort of enhancing these um, refugee host relations. So I think this is a very important issue that is on the, on, on the map in humanitarian interventions and development policies also nowadays. Um, I think I particularly want to highlight also what you would meant in terms of these changes that are taking place of these uh, local political economic um, uh, yeah, in, inter interactions and how these local changes relate then to external interventions. Um, so, you know, humanitarian actors coming in, going out, uh, money being poured, uh, so to speak, um, at a certain site uh, so that they can host refugees in a larger camp. And after a year, after years, this money is gone, and then nobody knows what to do. Um, he also mentioned, like with Agadez, the whole effect of the ex Europeans' externalization of, of borders and these old policies. Um, I think these are very, very um, important aspects that, sh that, that show in the multiple scales, you know, in which, um, let's say, the political economy of displacement um, is, being, is being played out. Um, I would like to turn to um, Tevotros, and um, as I understood, uh, I mean, you have worked also a lot on, on, on labor perspective, and you, you work like, for instance, on the, on the Jordan Compact uh, and, and others in, in this aspect, which are, have promised a lot uh, as in terms of like uh, solutions, you know, new, new, new efforts that exactly relate to what Morton has, Morton has said, like building economies, building perspective, economic perspectives not only for displaced people, but also for host, host communities. But nonetheless, we're still stuck somehow. And um, I haven't heard much about the Jordan Compact in the last two years uh, since all these big promises. Um, would be interested to, to hear your take on these compacts, for instance, and how this relates to this political economic perspective of displacement. Great, thank you, Benjamin. And, uh... 
thank you also Sarah and your, uh, Bergen Global for organizing this uh, interesting session and conversation. Uh, to speak about uh, the political economy of protracted displacement, as Morten has mentioned, our my interest and uh, our institute interest has been to understand the uh, displacement economies, broadly speaking. And uh, recently we have had um, three, four different projects looking at one of them financed by the Research Council of Norway, looking at the, uh, the nexus of uh, <clears throat> humanitarian assistance and long-term development particularly uh, on a project called Refugees for Development, examining practices and policy initiatives uh, in three countries, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Jordan. And our interest recently has also been to explore and understand the uh, impact of forced displacement, broadly speaking, particularly when it comes to uh, labor market impacts, both for refugees and that of the, uh, the host communities, if you will, and also the host communities a bit of a bit of a term that can can be debated as such. Um, more importantly, as you mentioned, Benjamin, we look at also, particularly in Jordan, the various policy instruments that has been in place, uh, especially since 2015. In the case of Jordan, we look at the, uh, the, the compact, which has been also exported, if you will, to out of Ethiopia. And in particular, the notion of work permits or as a policy instrument in terms of incentivizing work in displaced persons to, to engage in a labor market, particularly in a managed way. Uh, and we're trying to really understand what sort of broader impacts exist both for themselves and that of the, uh, the local economies. And uh, <clears throat> our understanding or some of the lessons that we are trying to that, are, that we are drawing uh, from this is that also uh, the issue of displacement is a bit inseparable from the larger and structural challenges, particularly that of economic development, uh, which plays uh, you know, a role at different levels when it comes to uh, how refugees are integrated or as you, as you also referred earlier, one of the durable solutions, how it relates to that. Uh, both from the experiences of you know the Middle East and that of also Uganda and Liberia that uh, Morten and I have worked at previously, is that also this uh, predominant view of you know uh, displaced persons as a burden for local economies and communities is partly supported by evidence, but at the same time also has been challenged because uh, recent studies on the impacts when it comes to very specific economic activities, not necessarily, you know, the broader implications tend to show that uh, they do actually contribute. Uh, so there is a, a <clears throat> bit of sort of trying to produce a unified narrative or a singular calculation on the relationship between, you know, displaced persons and that of the labor markets is a bit, uh, bit challenging. But when you consider uh, uh, various type of variables or indicators, uh, flexible factors or unknowns prevent you know, the discussion of you know, migrants, displaced persons in simple positive and negative terms, whereas the complexity also underscores the importance of empirical you know, context-based and holistic evidence that's rooted in understanding the broader political context surrounding the displacement of events. So, I mean, despite these complexities, I think, uh, and unknowns, there are, of course, certain trends that appear across, uh, across the various studies. And uh, one of the key takeaways that we can consider is also already vulnerable and disadvantaged uh, persons in the labor market tend to be disproportionately or negatively impacted by, you know, uh, the, bro the broader presence of, you know, uh, refugees or displaced persons, if you will, such as, you know, De decline in wages or competition in the labor market or increased level of unemployment uh, as a result of the displacement situations. And these groups include, you know, youth, women, casual workers or workers in the informal sector and immigrants groups as such. Uh, on the other hand, also, you have a positive side of it where relatively privileged groups tend to disproportionately benefit from the positive impacts of displacement as such. So the, the, in a way, the, the message is seems to be uh, rather fixed. So I think from a political economy point of view, uh, understanding or addressing you know, forced displacement or protracted situation, 
the uh, context is key the way I see it. Uh, for example, in the when you look at you know how the compact has been uh, initiated and conceptualized in the case of Ethiopia is mainly from if you look at it you know from the broader political motivations of it is from from the point to the point of you know making an investment case for for the fact that X number of refugees or displaced persons are there, then you wanna. That's also how it has become a bit of you know transactional in the way donors and, and governments are relating to to these issues. Uh, that's uh, perhaps where I should leave you know uh, some of the things that we are we are currently working on, and then perhaps we could also engage in, in the discussion. Great, yeah, thank you, um, Timotros. Um, so sort of speaking about Jordan and, and the Jordan Compact and how this has contributed or not, um, sort of to to you know um, improving the local situation for 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 um, displaced people. I would like to bring in um, Sarah now, um, who, who has led the, the the research in the traffic uh, project um, in and on on Jordan. Um, particularly, I think. One particularly important aspect that you mentioned, uh, the waters was so the, the would say like the class specific, the class dimension, right, or the social social class dimension that is clearly there. Um, sort of you know in terms when you look at the the impact of protracted displacement situations. So not speaking about you know the the impact of a refugees' presence at the place is not equal for all, but it's very it has to be very much differentiated um, perspective. So maybe Sarah, from your perspective, sort of, I mean, maybe this political economic di di dimension, um, both in the, the research you have done, I mean, not only of course in traffic, but your previous research um, in Jordan, uh, both, maybe you can also re refer to this class dimension in uh, how, how you looked at that or how, how uh, obvious this was in terms of different um, social um, class-based differentiations between those who have been displaced but also in those um, communities where people find refuge. Great, thank you. Uh, this discussion is so exciting and invigorating already. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A and uh, further discussion. So hopefully I can add uh, some, some nuggets of uh, additional information to contribute. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the translocal and transnational networks and connections that Syrians and Jordan have um, that we surveyed with the traffic project and what that means for mobility. And so what we found is that overall of our survey population, um, over 70% of the respondents reported that they had translocal or transnational network connections, um, which sounds like a pretty high number. Um, what we found, however, is that it, uh, really does track along who's inside of a camp and who's outside of a camp quite closely. Um, and so those inside Zatari camp, for example, only 16% reported having translocal or transnational connections. Whereas in the urban area of Mufra, that number was 90%. So while overall the, the population sort of showed this large uh, portion having these connections, in fact, class, uh, as Benjamin pointed out, becomes a major factor in pulling apart sort of who is connected and who has access to resources and who doesn't. And what we really found was actually that it, it also contributes to mobility or contributed to mobility outside of the camp. So in the earlier days of the Syrian refugee influx into Jordan, everybody was moved into the Zatari camp. And then those that were able to be sponsored through the Kefala system, that is through the sponsorship system, with a pre-existing family member who could sort of uh, vouch for them with the Jordanian government, they were able to get out of the camp. And so while um, everyone was initially sort of put in there, those with connections were able to leave. And so this is how uh, we have just 16% of the Syrians in Zatari camp reporting transnational connections because those that had them were able to get out. So what we found initially is that translocal and transnational networks, family and friend networks, contributed strongly to mobility within Jordan. And it wasn't just outside of the camp, out of Zatari, but it was nationally within the country as well, moving people from urban area to urban area or to peri-urban areas. So mobility domestically in Jordan for Syrian refugees tracks along these kin networks quite closely. But what we found is that it doesn't go beyond that. Uh, 
while some Jordanians or some, sorry, Syrians in Jordan have been able to leave the country and be resettled, that number is actually very, very small. Um, approximately 5,000 in 2019 alone. Um, the number that get resettled in general is very small, right? Like resettlement is not a viable option for most refugees. It is not a viable option for most Syrian refugees, even less is it an option for Syrian refugees in Jordan. And yet what we found is that uh, most of our respondents spoke uh, in an aspiring way towards mobility outside of Jordan. So there's a kind of contradiction. While only 16% uh, of our sample had applied for asylum to leave Jordan, in fact, nearly all of them spoke about it in these affectionate terms. They wanted to leave Jordan. They dreamed about going to places where they had family and friends already. And in most of those instances, uh, what we found is the, the countries that they spoke fondly of also tracked where they had family members. So we find that there's a strong affiliation or interest in moving to the Gulf, to the Gulf countries. Uh, Kuwait uh, in particular came up, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, where there are already Syrian friends and family that are working. Um, or to Western countries, including Canada and, uh, uh, sorry, Germany and the UK. So how is this possible, right? How is it that we see mobility working so well to help, um, or sorry, family networks working so well to facilitate mobility domestically, but internationally, it's much more limited. Um, and I think that actually class is a major uh, answer there as well, that what we saw in terms of sort of who stays in Zatari and who leaves um, follows these networks, so does who can leave Jordan more generally. And yet, people still um, aspire to having these international mobilities. And that's, I think, because it's free. It is largely free to dream. It is largely uh, an open possibility. People are able to, um, to think about reuniting with their families to hope and to, um, to care about that. And I think that in this case, the, this question of political economy um, on family networks and mobility in Jordan, as an anthropologist, uh, I see develops into new subjectivities. That people are, while they're not able necessarily to take the steps to apply for asylum or to be reunited with family, that doesn't stop them from thinking about it and from believing themselves as part of that narrative. That this idea of what a refugee should be uh, then comes to play in their lives as well, um, psychologically and in terms of their, their family networks and their mobility. Uh, there's a, a great uh, PhD thesis, Anne Christian Wagner from the University of Edinburgh, and she did a study of women in Mufraq, and she's got this very sort of short line, but I think that it's a, a larger concept that she says um, many of the, the Syrians in Mufraq are acting like migrants, right? They're not investing in Jordan. They're not, uh, th because they had these pre-existing mobilities in and out of Jordan, and when the crisis hit in Syria, they moved to a place where they had already known. Um, and so I think though that it's a broader concept. I think what we see is that there's a large discourse, international discourse, national discourse, global um, discourse that plays out locally in terms of who people think they should be. What should refugees be like? Um, what do they act like? What do they dream of? What do they think about, right? This cultivation of a new subjectivity is I think the kind of uh, anthropological take on a political economy of, uh, mm. of protracted displacement. Mm. Um, refugees in this case see themselves as still on the move, even though um, all signs point to the fact that they will not be able to leave Jordan, nor is it safe for them to return to Syria. Um, so those are my quick comments. I'm really keen to continue the discussion with all of uh, the rest of you. And um, so I'll turn it back to Benjamin to field some uh, questions and to facilitate uh, some of the, the Q&A as well. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, always fascinating to, to, to hear what you, what you draw out of your, your research in, in Jordan and how it relates to the, the translocal, transnational connections that people, people have. And, and particularly important these you know imaginations of you know being elsewhere of coming together again with family and um and how these yeah how they have changed you know self-perceptions of people and maybe also then hinder um i think sort of um efforts to you know 
stay and, 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 and rest in a, in a sense, you always better have the feeling you have to move on um, also elsewhere. Um, just want to point um, for, for the people in the audience, um, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, that um, we, will, uh, we will ask, but you're free to, uh, free to post questions in this um, Q&A section as well. Um, so those who listen, um, yeah, if you have anything, please write it. Um, in the Q&A and um, please also say um, to, to whom the question is being, uh, being addressed. Um, so we have that. Um, so I think following on, on what Sarah just has said, um, I was again wondering about the particular role of mobility in the context of protracted um, displacement. I mean, this um, it has been quite clear in all of your, all of your, uh, all of your talks, um, um, over, you know, that I mean, we, we see that like in Bosnia, this, the situation there is, it's all about, you know, the mobility and, um, and, and people who are trying to play the game, trying to cross, uh, cross the border to Croatia, to Slovenia, to Italy. And we know that there's the illegal pushbacks um, taking place, bringing people, bringing people back. Um, it's all about the immobility and immobility question there. So the whole situation is very much framed by, by, this, by this question. Um, but also, in Morton, in your contribution, when you the, the, the two cases that you presented um, from um, Machiavelli camp in, in Uganda, but in Agadez, so it's a very different um, different um, notions of mobility. I mean, I know from other research I saw about uh, about Uganda and the Machiavelli camp, it's also not about those being there only in the camp and the local economies, but there's also multiple mobilities um, taking place, and now people are actually moving back and forth also between Uganda and um, the Congo, for instance. Um, so there's actually in there a lot more mobilities um, than, than one would envisage. So, um, so maybe it, each of you can maybe just revisit um, this, this aspect again, so you know, what, you know what, what the role is mobility in, in this context and, um, and, um, and maybe also not only the mobilities um, of the displaced people, but also the mobilities of other actors as well. For instance, mm -hmm. humanitarian agencies, um, and so who shape these local situations uh, very much. Yeah. Maybe Sinove, we start with you again. Yeah, sure, thank you. I think uh, this immobility, mobility, uh, in the case of Bosnia uh, and the refugees and migrants who are moving through there is really about creating a future. So why do they keep on moving? Well, it's because they don't think that they will be able to create a future in Bosnia or Serbia, and thus they need to move on. And I think they, what I also find important to recognize in the Balkan case is that um, the immobility mobility is also reflecting how uh, although EU policies and structures and, and Frontex and all its instruments are trying to stop people and try to have this gov governmentality and, and like really uh, creating walls, they are not capable of doing so. So this immobility mobility is also showing this relationship, uh, what, we, what we in anthropology is very concerned about the agency structure relationship. So they're not able to stop. And sometimes I've been thinking, uh, at least in anthropology, there's a very common perception that we are thinking about how uh, migrants and refugees are responding and reacting. But sometimes I think it's the opposite that goes on, that actually EU policies and national policies and the border construction and the management of the borders are actually also a, a reaction towards the mobility of the migrants, right? So this interaction, it's, it's really something that has fascinated me and I think is really important to recognize. And now this is very much tied up to the political economy and, and it's tied up to other uh, actors, as you mentioned, Benjamin. In, in the Bosnia and Serbia case, it's, very important actors are smugglers. They're very professional. They have existed for long. They're using routes which they have used for 20, 30 years for other uh, aspects, materiality, for weapons, for drugs, uh, et cetera. And these are also very much mobile. Uh, I talked to one smuggler and mobile in different ways. Uh, man many of the smugglers are, are, are Bosnians or Serbians, but a lot of them also have ethnic background. I talked to uh, three smugglers from all of them from Kurdistan, Iraq, and one of them, for him, it was a seasonal job. So actually uh, when it was off season, so in the winter, 
parts it's really hard to move through because it's because it's a lot of snow it's very cold so it's hard to get people through in the region so he went back to iraq where his wife was and his children and then he came back during the summer and continued his work there so it's also uh, so you actually have transnational uh, mo mobility of those who are part of this and and we also another smuggler that i talked to he had become a smuggler because he was transversing uh, Bosnia, he had gathered enough money, uh, um, actually was in Serbia and Belgrade, he had gotten enough money, was on his way out, and then his uh, co-inhabitant, uh, the person he lived with, uh, took his money, and so he was stuck there without any money, and in order to save up money quickly, he became a smuggler. So, and he had um, become familiar with going on the game uh, on a um, over several years. So that's also, you know, this immobility, mobility also is, is linked also to the economy of the individual person. Uh, it's very class-based. Do you have do you have a family at home? Uh, a lot of the stops are also you waiting for your family to send you more money. How quickly that can be done is really depending on uh, the, 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 educate, the uh, work of your family uh, in, in the countries. Um, and also social network. Who do you know? Who can you trust? And also, I think I don't. I haven't looked into that. But the idea of trust. Who can you trust when you are traveling is also really important. And there might be some class uh, issues there as well. Actually, uh, I can go on, but I think I'll, I'll move over to the next speaker on this question. Yeah, I mean uh, just. Yeah, I don't want to comment. Maybe just um, continue again, Morten. Thank you. Um, let me use this opportunity to just highlight um, a couple of distinctions that I think is important before I end with a sort of small uh, case study to tie into what was just said. And, when it comes to mobility, I think it's important that we think about at least two types of mobility. It's the social mobility and it's the geographical mobility. And what people, people on the move, what they really crave for is not necessarily geographic mobility, but the social mobility. But they think they have to, to move geographically in order to achieve the social mobility. So I think that's an important distinction that we need to keep in mind. And for many people, I mean, they are just exchanging one geographical context to another without actually really improving on their social mobility. Whereas some, some other people succeed. And this impacts on the whole sort of situation, this idea about social and geographic mobility and how they tie together and, and and have not, and so on. Uh, and then this again is shaped, of course, by various local but also global contexts uh, to, uh, to the extent to which um, either routes are open, routes are closed, uh, dams are built, walls are built, and so on and so forth. To the latter, what we know is that, I mean, if the crisis are uh, dire enough or hope is simply lacking, I mean, the, the dam or the wall will never be high enough. So it will all, all, always be somebody who is either are able to slide over the wall that we try to construct or new routes are open. We see this all the time in the case of the Sahel Sahara. I mean, where, um, if one route is closed down, then another reopens. There are new interpretations of paths and routes and so on. It's a constantly changing dynamical game where to a certain extent you can say that those that tries, tries to build these dams, they are con constantly only reactive, only running after. So that's one part of this with the mobility, non-mobility, social, geographic. Another thing which I think is interesting, which ties into just what said, was this about the people who are actually are involved in this. I mean, the, the fixers or the transporters or the traffickers. Personally, I avoid the term traffickers because it's sort of, gives you connotations about a, a form of illegality of criminality that uh, and that people are sort of either lured or forced to travel, which is obviously not the case. I mean, 
people try in 99% of the cases, I mean, people travel because they want to travel, they want to move. And we see much of the same in uh, Agadez, as just was alluded to in, in the Balkans. I mean, this is this has become part of the livelihood, but it's for many people, it's part time. I mean, uh, one um, fixed slash transporter that I have talked a lot to in uh, Agadez, I mean, he He's an, uh, originally from Nigeria. I mean, he calls himself the genius. I have no idea what his real name is, and I never asked either. And it's not anything that I re really need to know. But I mean, the guy is basically he's a part time a painter. He's painting houses for people, and part time a fixer transport. And I mean, ideally, I mean, what he told me, which I believe in, is that ideally, I mean, what he would like to do is to set up a paint making factory. And uh, while that's a dream that I think will never come true, I mean, he's sort of trying to finance his sort of business activities, the more formal part of it, by being involved in the transporting of mainly migrants. Because, I mean, what he works on is the connections to the middle belt in Nigeria. And these are people who basically have the money to move. And there is an important distinction here that I think we also need to make, which I uh, have made in the past in an article, sort of separating between the visible and the invisible when it comes to uh, particularly to refugee migrant uh, crises, because the ones that are seen, the ones that count, are the ones that are on the move. But you have all these people who are not only temporarily stuck, but are really, really stuck. For example, the one point. 1.2 to 1.5 million people who are completely stuck in northeastern Nigeria. These are among the poorest populations in the world, and they are not moving anywhere. Why are they not moving anywhere? Because they cannot pay genius in order to travel first from Nigeria to Niger into Agadez and on to Libya. They lack the means, and they lack the networks in order to do this. Because in order to be on the game, so to speak, you need some money, you need some resources, you need some network. And many of those that are really caught in the very worst situations, we never see them. They don't count in the, how should I say, the global game of migration refugee management because we, meaning the international community and Europe, we don't need to manage these people because they're not coming here. They are completely stuck. And this is perhaps where this term protractedness hits the best, is for those that are not moving, that are completely stuck because they lack the means and networks in order to travel. And I do think that this is an important distinction. And that's part, what I see as part of my work is trying to bring these invisible ones more to the fore of the international debate than they are. They emerge every now and then, but when they emerge, it's, they are completely objects. They're objects who, onto whom we, as sort of the humanitarian elite of the world, should act. But that's the only way I'm the come into the global story. When, for example, Jan Egeland of the Norwegian Refugee Council, I'm not saying this to criticize him at all, talks about them. But otherwise, we simply don't see them. We see them when we are talked about by humanitarian actors, otherwise they are invisible, and we can let them remain invisible because they are simply not heading in our direction. That's an older sort of part of this story that which I think is important that is told and it's put more focus on. I'll stop there for now. Yeah, great. Um, moving on directly to Timotros, um, sort of who are the invisible ones um, in, in your research, you know, that uh, you might see, but that others don't. And um, does it also relate to mobility or Thanks, Benjamin. mobilization? Yeah. yeah, no, talking about invisibility, I think sort of uh, a couple of uh, cases come to mind when I, when I think of mobility issues, particularly in a manner that they play uh, when it comes to policies and solutions. Uh, the first one is, I mean, uh, the case of Afghan refugees, Afghan refugees issues in Pakistan, 
has been an interesting case for the last 41 or two years. And, and it's interesting in a sense that how the fact that, you know, the, the mobility of refugees back and forth across the border is also tied into, um, in a kind of, you know, reactive policies, particularly if you look at the, uh, the solutions, the strategy for Afghan refugees, which has been sort of whether the predominant policy in the region, uh, including Iran, is how uh, the stuckness or the immobility of refugees in that particular region, including the kind of role that it plays, tilting the dynamics, ethnic dynamics. If you look at the Baluchistan region, for example, I think the immobility becomes quite important to understand how it's perpetuated over time, how it's reinforced, how it's also entangled to the drivers of the displacement to begin with in the type of responses that, uh, that we offer. And another uh, important issue in understanding mobility is also as to add one more term is also economic mobility, economic mobility for, for whom and how existing skills, uh, perhaps also entrepreneurial capacity also influences how refugees could be able to climb up the ladder, if you will. Uh, as Morton has called them, you know, the lords of Nakivale, for instance, uh, are those that have managed to, to utilize and capitalize on the existing policy and program initiatives. For example, if you look at, you know, how the Somali refugees uh, become the lords in Nakivale, basically, you know, sort of, you know, commanding land transactions and all of that is quite interesting aspect to understand how economic mobility could also be shaped by existing policies uh, in a particular displacement setting. And leave it at that. Okay, uh, yeah, great. Coming, coming back to, uh, to you, Sarah, I mean, I know from your, from your work um, or the, the, the people you and the Yarmouk University team spoke, uh, spoke to, they often also referred about um, those, those people, you know, who have helped them in, in their mobility. In first of coming um, coming to Jordan, um, political political actors, militias, armed groups, or so who supported their mobility. Um, maybe you want to um, come back to this as well. Sure. Um, we did find yes that the links between uh, translocal and transnational networks or family connections uh, pre-existed, of course, the movement into Jordan. And in many instances were a facilitating factor in moving to Jordan. And so uh, we had stories uh, from some of our interviewees in which they described, you know, moving a, a whole neighborhood at one time to the border. Um, but they didn't necessarily have connections at each, each stop along the way. Um, and so they would work with various uh, opposition groups um, to facilitate sort of their movement to the next stop. And then, you know, you share tea and coffee and learn a little bit, and then you can go to the next stop and go to the next stop. And, you know, some of these mobility trajectories were really profound. Uh, they would go from, you know, Southern Syria up to Northern Syria and then over to Eastern Syria and into Iraq even and along the desert. I mean, and they were, it was not the most direct route, but it was the route that they could, could make happen, right? And so you find that um, at least in this, this case of Syrians in Jordan, like family networks um, and transnational connections, translocal connections and mobility are very closely linked. Um, and I think that, that's, it's important not to overstate that, that there are times where either people do not have those connections or they decide that they're going to sort of step back or bow out, right? And we see this in all kinds of, of cases, that this kind of political economy of what a refugee should be or how they should act can play out in really sort of tangible everyday ways. So um, I have an earlier piece that I wrote on the case of Zatari and how the refugees in Zatari uh, essentially like had to become time managers and managers of being a refugee as a full-time job. They would spend every day managing this class for themselves or that education for their kids or that, 
uh, aid distribution point or this one or that one. And they're like the schedule of activities that the UN had and all of the various organizations had throughout the whole camp meant that a, a family spent every day, all day managing where to go for this appointment or where to go for that stop or this education or that aid. And so like becoming a refugee meant having to sort of uh, rationalize or bureaucratize their everyday lives in order to participate in this system. Well, I mean, yes, it's survival and it's necessary, but who wants to do this? Uh, and so, you know, certainly we have cases as well in the research of people who say, I'm not going to uh, embrace this. I'm not going to participate in this. I would like to do and be someone else. I would like to participate in life and livelihood in ways that are not defined solely by the refugee regime, that are not defined so strongly by this kind of uh, political economy position. And, you know, we have a couple of a if you'll indulge me for a second, a couple of quotes um, where like one, uh, one woman said, they called me to go to Spain, but I refused because we know some people who went there and they told us that life there is not good. They said that refugees there are not, satisf not satisfied because they live in private rooms where the kitchens and bathrooms are shared by all the families. So you see that this idea of, you know, what a refugee should want or what um, the political economy regime tells them is this kind of durable solution, a final um, point that they can, can achieve uh, can be cross-cut by other desires and other interests. In this case, um, you know, concerns about privacy and concerns about the family. We found a few other cases where um, some Syrians in Jordan said, we wanna just stay in Jordan. The culture is the same, the language is the same, the dress is the same, we can become invisible. And invisibility is a kind of two pronged, two sides of a coin condition. On the one hand, invisibility can be uh, useful if you're looking for anonymity, you're looking to blend in, to not have any sort of markers upon you. But invisibility is also, it, or it can be at least dangerous in the sense that you might uh, lose people, right? And so I think um, these points about invisibility that, that Morton and Wedros raised uh, are really important and that there is a whole kind of um, exploration mm -hmm. of, uh, of those issues that we could, could also do. Um, so I, I think that this is like the questions of mobility and networks and uh, visibility all still connect uh, somehow in this political economy framework. Great. I mean, I noted down a few points uh, that I would like to take up now. Um, I mean, I think at first I found it very um, interesting um, also, Sinova, how you, how you flip the coin, you know, sort of where we always framing sort of how migrants, refugees, displaced people are somehow navigating through bureaucratic spheres, what, what Sarah also just described, but in effect, I mean, what we saw in terms of like the large scale movements towards, towards Europe um, in the long summer of migration or so, you know, people and their mobilities, their everyday practices, they have changed the world. I mean, they have changed policies and actually it's the it's policies that are trying constantly trying to react um, to the strategies that, that, that people are using in terms of, for instance, um, border crossing. So it's not only, I mean, I mean, we can highlight this as an aspect of like the autonomy of migration or of, of migrants, migrants agency with which actually the state, you know, or the states or, you know, territorial institutions are constantly struggling because people are somehow, you know, um, um, you know how do I say that? Um, not, not, they're not uh, working or along the rules, right? They, they, they cross boundaries uh, and they're not meant to do, not meant to do so. I think that's a really important uh, case, case in point. I also found very fascinating now that we talked about um, the migration industry or so, the old people who facilitate um, mobility and, this, and that this is part, um, also part um, of everyday livelihoods, um, of course, of people, um, of the local communities that are there. Um, I particularly like there's a very good book by um, Peter Tinti and Tuesday Raytano, Migrant, Refugee, Smuggler, Savior, um, which also sh shows this sort of the whole conceptualization of thinking about smuggling and traffickers or so this and all this sort of criminal gangs that are moving people from, a, um, from across borders or so. Um, it's partly true, 
only, but it's from, for many people, it's a very locally embedded um, livelihood, which is then also part then of the uh, local local political um, e economy, as Morton as, as Morton has explained um, in, in a bit the case of, of, of Agades. I think that's really um, important. So people benefit from other people's mobilities, whereas um, you know sort of the policies of law they try to you know restrain people in their mobilities and thereby also jeopardize these livelihoods that are being around, uh, being built around other people's um, mobilities. Um, I think this notion sort of with the invisibility and those people who are trapped, and uh, I think it's again, a very, very important point, um, which, which I think links uh, again to this whole class perspective, um, sort of the necessity to have sufficient um, capital to being able to make it um, to, to another place. I mean, it's quite clear sort of where we see the, um, differences between protracted displacement or protractedly displaced um, people who have crossed an international border. So more than two thirds of the 82 million um, people announced by the UN, UNHCR last week. I mean, they are IDPs and, um, and the growth of the global stock um, of displaced people is largely due on the one hand that refugee situations are not uh, resolved but on the other hand, a growing number of people who are displaced within, uh, within their country. And for many of them, it's actually really also a lack of means and a lack of networks um, that doesn't enable them to move, move, move outside of the country, but also some um, do not prefer, prefer to do so. Um, so also in the traffic research that we did now in, in, in Germany, we also spoke to, 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 um, to Afghan migrants, to uh, people who came um, from, from Syria since 2014, um, from Eritrea. And there we also see large sort of class-based um, dis uh, uh, distinctions. And I would really say sort of um, that those who have actually made it to Europe um, have been, yeah, those who have been economically um, yeah, privileged um, in, in the first place or who have had previous networks um, to, to Europe before. I mean, of course, not all, some others took, took also this route but you really see the what um, close links to what Morton said, sort of between the um, yeah, social position and then the, the sp and spatial and spatial and spatial mobility, um, which I think lead, which would lead me, um, I think, also then to the to the um, other questions sort of that that we had prepared um, before. Um, whether this can also be um, seen as a yeah, dis disadvantage or who who do we lose out of sight. Um, when we now look at refugees and migrants as assets, um, as you know, sort of we have um, people who come in um, who can be who can be employed. Um, Morton already mentioned it in terms of like agricultural labor um, around um, the, the Machiavelli camp uh, in, in Uganda. Um, and this, I think there's a, a same danger here again as with mobility that we only look to those you know who are employable you know who who have the, the have the skills who have the capital who have the physical um, capacity um, who have uh, not been so traumatized uh, traumatized that they can actually work um, so maybe from 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 your work um, that you do maybe you can say a few more words about that sort of this the economic dimension after displacement and talk about like this employability and uh, sort of how refugees or migrants are also seen now as 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 beneficiaries um, not only of humanitarian protection but also as being beneficial to 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 local um, economies um, maybe i would like to turn it around first uh, now and start with um Timotros. um you know, because that's also, I think, the, the, the whole labor market aspect um, is, is one of the fields that you're specialized in. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, yeah, I think it's sort of, uh, if you also see some of the uh, major policies that have become in place for the past few years, they are mainly intended to, to promote uh, local integration, particularly participation in the labor market. And uh, what we are seeing from, uh, from an evidence both for, uh, from Jordan, as well as also Ethiopia, for example, and Uganda, the case in point is that uh, a couple of points that I'd like to make is also, first of all, the uh, primarily the gender dimension, 
which for instance, in, in particularly in the case of Syria, where we have a limited uh, level of participation among women when it comes to work, which is also quite common across the region. Uh, but but um, the main one, main issue is also what sort of policies are in place that are governing the, uh, you know, uh, participation in the labor market. In the case of in the case of Jordan, it's managed through, you know, work permit policies that could be rather restrictive of uh, particular sectors. So there are some sectors that are open to refugees, whereas other sectors are closed. So in the way Jordan have gone about it is from the perspective of, you know, a managed work permit regime that has become relatively flexible over the past few years. But uh, we also see, uh, uh, for example, the refugees that are uh, navigating such postal policies in uh, an extremely informal way. Uh, you may have, you know, work permit that allows you to work in the construction sector, which is sort of open to to refugees, whereas, you know, the the markets are available to uh, in the service industry, for example, in restaurant businesses or barbers and so on. So, in a way, refugees navigate uh, policies uh, through informal uh, ways uh, of taking part in in the labor market situations. So, I think one of the constraints that I see are uh, are policies that are sort of constraining uh, refugees in terms of the extent of participation that they may have within within the local labor market setting. Uh, if you look at Ethiopia, uh, they've, they've gone about it. I mean, particularly since 2019, the, the refugee law allows, uh, or the new refugee law allows refugees to work, uh, but the kind of policy instruments are not there in place yet in terms of to what extent could they uh, take part in, in the labor market situations. But what we see both in Jordan and Ethiopia and other settings is the extent of informality. So, so, so where, where refugees tend to, to work more in informal markets of at times also uh, a kind of work arrangement that could be exploitative and uh, not necessarily providing you no know, work conditions for, for, for refugees. And these are uh, still quite active uh, policy areas that should of be concerned when it comes to how protracted situations are, are managed. Great. Yeah, thanks, Devotris. I was also, um, again, just pointed to the notion of time, <laughs> of also uh, of our discussion that this doesn't become too protracted. Um, so they would also like to ask um, then Morten, Sinove, and, and Sarah um, to, to address the question that I just posed, but also um, yeah, see that as a concluding statement from your side. Yeah, first, Morton, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Benjamin. Uh, and obviously, there is an economic dim dimension to this, and it's important, and it plays out differently in different contexts. I think what we could say is that to this question of whether refugees and migrants are beneficial or not to local economies, we can just say that there is neither a yes or a no question. It all depends on the local context. It depends on the political conditions, the economic conditions, but it also depends on, and, and, and it depends on the state of that local economy. How is it managed? How, how is it regulated? What are the needs at the local economy? I mean, if, if you have a local economy that is running uh, pretty well and there is demand for labor, I mean, obviously, I mean, getting additional labor. And as most refugees and migrants, after all, tend to be relatively young. I mean, having an influx of a young labor force which then would be at least, again, everything else equal, relatively healthy and can work for a long time. Well, I mean, then uh, it can certainly be beneficial, particularly if this uh, economy is regulated to the extent that this, uh, the, the influx of an increased labor force do not lead to a race to the bottom with regard to, to salaries, work conditions, these kind of things. 
On the other hand, I mean, if the economy is not very well regulated, if it's more of a patrimonial economy um, with a lot of informality, lack of anything that even looks like proper labor regulations. And in addition, there are not shortages in the labor market, but surpluses. I mean, then what you will see then is this kind of very easily, this kind of race to the bottom. And often also expressions of anger from at least various segments of local hosts who basically think that the refugees are coming and taking uh, and migrants are coming and taking their jobs. I mean, today in this regard, I mean, some of these local debates that you find around large refugee settlements in, uh, in Africa, you see it also in Lebanon, is relatively similar to the kind of debates that you, uh, that you also see in Europe uh, around the, the same issues. I mean, people are people. And uh, if changes happen suddenly to them and they don't understand why they are happening and they believe that this has a negative impact on their uh, own livelihood, job security and so on and so forth, well, then people will become frustrated. They will become angry. I mean, that's the, that's the case everywhere. Uh, of course, I mean, I would say that everything else equal. I mean, people in places like Lebanon, parts of Uganda and so on and so forth have much more reasons and real reasons to be frustrated, to feel uncertain, to be angry than, than uh, I would say that, that the overall majority of Norwegians would have, for example. Why is that the case? Is the case because the Norwegian economy, after all, is very well regulated. So it, I mean, there is a point here about the ability to regulate the economy and how, instead of sort of thinking about this, we need to help refugees how can, we, how can we think about how can we facilitate a, regul a regulation of local economies that at least avoids the worst cases of these races to the bottom? And that aspect, I think, yes, I mean, I agree with you, Benny. I mean, that parts of what I was saying about this uh, local host uh, refugee migrant relationship, yes, it's there in the UN Global Compact, it's there in a lot of at least belatedly, I would say, it's also come as part of the vocabulary of at least most of the humanitarian organizations involved in refugee slash migration management. But to the extent that this is implemented in practice, to, take, to try to sort of always in an intervention, try to cater for both aspects, both the local host perspective and the refugee migrant perspective, in any kind of in all kinds of interventions, so that this is mainstream across humanitarian programming, it's still a very long way to go. I mean, it's good that they have started recognizing it, recognizing it in policy, in practice. There's still a long way to go, and there is a challenge here. And I think that part of that challenge is also to bring this even more to the fore than what is currently the case. Also into re, not only research but also into the policy papers that many of us are in fact contribute to. So it's a, it's a challenge for the humanitarian organization how to implement this perspective, but it is also a challenge for those who do research on this to, to always try to see both sides of this equation, so to speak, and I'll end there, but uh, thanks. Okay, great. Um, let me give the, the, the last word um, of, the, of today first, uh, first to Sinove. Um, and then to, to Sarah to wrap it up. Okay. So thank you. I think I like to talk about this risk of, uh, of focusing on, on economic uh, contributions of uh, refugees and migrants from a little bit different angle than what we've done till now. And uh, some years ago, I did field work with irregular migrants in Norway. So irregular, most of them had become irregularized because they had uh, their uh, asylum application rejected in Norway and then continued living in Norway. And uh, some, when I was doing field work, a lot of them went to the street and they had a political demonstration. It was very public. They, they set up tents in the middle of Oslo and they were demonstrating. And a lot of those uh, protest slogans that they used were actually related to work. And that's why it's relevant in this discussion. They were saying, we were tax givers. We were taxpayers and we're now on the street. And they were focusing on the fact that they had been working 
and they were working some of them for a very long time so promoting themselves as a good citizen because they had contributed to the welfare state as workers and of course this was a very important point and it did reach out and it was very uh, recognizable to the Norwegian citizens and they all saw the injustice in it but this kind of demonstration then and, and protest is, is sac simultaneously sacrificing the sick, the youth, the older, those who cannot work for various reasons. And I think then, and this will be my last point here, and I think this is also reducing humanity to, to workers. And, and that's a, a huge risk in this uh, process. Thank you. Oh. Uh, there are so many rich ideas that have come out of the, the last hour and 45 minutes, and uh, I, I can't uh, begin to summarize all of them, uh, nor do I want to. I mean, I think that this is a really great moment for us to say, this has been a fantastic discussion and we will just pick it up again uh, at the next time. And uh, I really wanna take a special moment to thank Benjamin for his contribution and for his moderating efforts. Uh, it was very, very well uh, received. So thank you for that. Uh, to Wedros, Morton, and Sonova, thank you all for your really uh, enjoyable and generative, intellectually stimulating contributions to the discussion. I mean, I, I think Sonova's point is a great one to end on, that ultimately we're all in this because we care about the people who are uh, involved, the host communities, the refugees, the migrants, um, at, at every sort of phase or stop along a route or uh, within a marketplace, uh, or at a policymaker kind of level. I mean, these are all important uh, aspects because they impact who we are uh, in the global community. And so I thank you all for your contributions and for your good reminders of this. Um, and to those of you who have tuned in, uh, thank you for joining us.